In the last class, I told you about the uh, endoscopic anatomy of frontal sinus. You have to study this because then only you will get a clear picture of the lateral wall of nose, then the drainage pathways of each sinuses and also the etio when you study the go to the uh, pathophysiology of uh, sinusitis and also the osteometal complex then that part will be easy and remember the anatomy you studied during your first MBBS classes is entirely different from that of clinical anatomy or endoscopic anatomy. So in this class I will deal with the maxillary science. Okay. Maxillary science. In this class I will tell you about the osteology of maxilla, the, about the natural osteum, its clinical uh, or endoscopic relations uh, in the uh, lateral wall of nose, the accessory osteum and methods to identify uh, the maxillary osteum uh, during an endoscopy. Okay, and also its clinical significance, right? So, uh, first you go through the osteology of maxilla. Maxilla is the second largest facial bone and this forms majority of the roof of mouth then uh, lateral wall that is the lateral wall of a nose and floor of the nasal cavity including the anterior nasal spine and this body is a quadrilateral pyramid and it contains maxillary sinus majority of the floor, uh, roof of oral cavity and also the uh, four processes and the floor of orbit okay and you will you can see the uh, maxillary hiatus on the medial surface of the maxilla see that is a maxillary hiatus and in life it is completed by number of bones and mucous membrane and this leave the na uh, natural maxillary osteum at the base of the ethmoid infundibulum okay and there are also four processes for the maxilla that is the uh, palatine then alveolar uh, zygomatic and frontal that is the alveolar process and it forms the alveolar arch when the two maxilla are articulated okay and that is a frontal uh, process which bears the anterior lacrimal crest to that uh, which the medial palpebral ligament is attached and this is the palatine process which forms a large portion of the nasal cavity and the floor uh, and the uh, roof of mouth posteriorly this uh, palatine process articulate with the palatine bone to complete the hard palate and there are also the zygomatic process okay so now uh, you know the relations of the uh, maxilla what comes anteriorly this uh, anterior wall comes the skin followed by the uh, fat, subcutaneous tissue and the facial musculature, isn't it? And what comes superiorly? Superiorly comes the orbit and along with that there is a you saw an infraorbital foramen and this infraorbital foramen going to infraorbital canal, isn't it? So this infraorbital foramen, uh, through the infraorbital foramen passes which all uh, structures it is infraorbital nerve and artery, isn't it? So there are variations. Sometimes this will be uh, very much superficial to the uh, maxilla, roof of maxilla, and in some cases this will pass through this to a separate. This is a coronal section actually, and sometimes you will see this as like this. If you take a CT scan. You will see the <coughs> infraorbital canal like this. It will go through the uh, maxillary sinus. Okay, it's an infraorbital canal, and that is why, in cases of surgeries of the maxilla, or there is fracture of the maxilla, or there is uh, malignancy affecting the anterior as well as the uh, roof of maxilla, you get paresthesia of the cheek. That is because of the involvement of the infraorbital nerve. Okay, so that is about the roof. I told the anterior wall and the roof. Then what comes laterally? Mainly the infratemporal fossa. 
and posteriorly what is a posterior relation what is that laterally posterior wall laterally related to the infratemporal fossa and it is medially related to the pterygopalatine fossa and also in the posterior wall there are canals for the posterior superior alveolar nerves and vessels okay and in the lower part that is the posterior inferior part that is a, there is a maxillary tuberosity and to which attach the medial pterygoid muscle. The inferior relation uh, of the maxilla is the uh, um, upper dentition as well as a hard palate here. And you have to remember that this uh, second premolar and all the three molars as are related to the uh, maxillary sinus. The second premolar and also the all the three molars. And the importance is that or in almost all the cases, the first molar is first molar. Okay, your first molar teeth will project into the maxillary sinus. And it is separated from the maxillary sinus, floor of the maxillary sinus, only by a small, very thin plate of bone or sometimes there, there will only be a layer of mucosa. There is chance of second premolar and all the three molar, but this is especially in the case of a first molar. So during extraction, there is chance of injury to breakage of this mucosal layer and formation of an oroandrin fistula. Okay, and if the teeth or the root of uh, this danger is uh, um, protruded into the uh, maxillary sinus, and if there is breakage of the separation, partition, either maybe a thin bone of, uh, thin plate of bone or the mucosa, there is chance of formation of an oroandrin fistula. And also, in most of the cases, the maxillary, the cause of maxillary sinusitis is dendogenic, infection of the teeth, dangers. And regarding the uh, medial wall, you saw that in your uh, independent disarticulated bone, it is a uh, large opening like this but in life this opening this large opening is close to a very small natural ostium of around 2 to 4 millimeters this natural ostium is around 2 to 4 millimeters in size in life and how this big uh, opening is made into a 2 to 4 millimeter size ostium because there is articulation with the mainly uh, one bone that is the inferior conca or the inferior turbinate bone. Where it comes? Here comes the inferior turbinate. This part. Okay. This inferior turbinate. This is a coronal section and think it as a sagittal section. Okay. So here comes your inferior turbinate. And there is another bone which is a lacrimal bone. Okay. So here comes your lacrimal bone. Okay, so you can uh, you are uh, the importance of this lacrimal bone in relation to the maxillary sinus ostium comes when you do a uh, endoscopic dacryocystorhinostomy for chronic dacryocystitis. Endoscopic DCR. Okay, so this is the inferior turbinate and this is a lacrimal bone. Another important uh, bone which is articulating with this is the perpendicular plate of palatine bone. Here comes it. Okay. So there comes the perpendicular plate of palatine bone and also this ethmoid bone is coming like this because the from the ethmoid bone comes the middle terminate. Okay. So that actually comes over this. Almost uh, on this part comes the ethmoid bone. Okay. So because of all this and also the mucosa, the inferior turbinate in the lower part, then uh, the lacrimal bone anteriorly and posteriorly comes the perpendicular plate of uh, palatine bone and superiorly and medially comes the ethmoid bone and also by the uh, mucosa covering. So this wide ostium of the uh, maxillary sinus is reduced to a 2 to 4 millimeter size ostium in life. And how this uh, drains 
Before that, uh, what is the transport, route of transport of the mucosa? We saw that in the frontal sinus, it moves from floor, it goes vertically upwards, then goes uh, laterally and again comes at a bird like pattern. Here it is like a stellate pattern. How is that? Flung from the floor, it comes through the uh, posterior wall, then the anterior wall, then the uh, medial wall, lateral wall and towards the roof. Okay. And all from all these parts, it will go towards the natural ostium. Right? Towards the natural ostium. And don't think it is like this. Even when it reaches to the natural ostium, it can't come to the middle meatus. Don't think like that. Why? Because in life, it has to go through some of the recesses before reaching the uh, middle meatus. And what, uh, what is that? It is the ethmoid infundibulum. Okay. So, from the natural ostium, the secretions will go to the ethmoid infundibulum. Ethmoid in ethmoid infundibulum. What is that? Uh, in the along with the frontal sinus also, I told you one term that is the uncinate process. What is this uncinate process? This is the inferior turbinate. Okay, this is the inferior turbinate and this is a middle turbinate, right? Any doubt in that? Okay, so this is the inferior turbinate. So I told you this uh, uncinate process is a sickle shaped or a crescent shaped structure which passes or it, uh, which is attached below to the inferior turbinate. Th there is no change in that. So from the inferior turbinate, this uncinate process go up. And it has uh, the upper attachment, it has got three variations. Either it can go to the medial wall of orbit or it can go to the middle turbinate. Okay. Or it can go to where is that base of skull. Okay, this is the base of skull. This is your cribriform plate and the base of skull. Okay. So, in all the cases, the inferior attachment remains the same. That is the inferior turbinate. Okay, you got it? So, uncinate process goes from the inferior turbinate. There is no variation in the lower attachment. That is always the inferior turbinate. And the superior attachment can be either into the uh, medial wall of orbit or into the skull base or to the inferior turbinate. In either case, this space is the ethmoid infundibulum. That is the space between uncinate process medially and lamina papyracea. What is that? It is a papery thin plate of bone which separates the orbit from the uh, nasal cavity. Okay. Broadly you can tell it like that. Actually it is from the ethmoid bulla and the ethmoid infundibulum. But for uh, you people, just for understanding, remember this lamina papyracea separates the orbit. This is the orbit. Orbit from the nasal cavity. So this, this here comes the ethmoid infundibulum. Here. This part. From this, uh, the natural ostium the secretions will go to, or in other words, the natural ostium, this 2 to 4 millimeter sized natural ostium will open into the floor of the posterior one third of the ethmoid infundibulum. Okay, is in the floor of posterior one third. Natural ostium of the maxillary sinus opens into floor of posterior one third of ethmoid infundibulum. And ethmoid infundibulum is a space between uncinate process medially and lamina papyracea laterally. You got it? Um, and uh, one other thing you have to remember, the another name for uh, maxillary sinus is the andrum of hymore. Andrum of hymore. Okay. Because this is the largest of the uh, sinuses. So it is called andrum of hymore. Right? 
uh, and the volume comes to around 15 to 30 ml, right? 15 to 30 ml. This uh, maxillary sinus is present at birth and at birth it is not like this. This much of uh, volume or this much of size is not there. Okay. At birth it is very shallow. Okay. This comes to like uh, this only this much. Very shallow and maybe up to the uh, just up to the floor of orbit. Then there are two phases, biphasic development. The first phase, active phase is up to 3 years of age. The first, there are two uh, peak. The first week, peak is first 3 years of age. Then second peak comes to around 12 years of age. And this grows, grows, grows and at around 18 to 20 years of age, it becomes adult size and when it attains adult, adult size it is below the level of floor of, floor of uh, nose okay this is a floor of nose and the size comes below around uh, 2 to 4 centimeters below the level of floor of nose okay that is the importance so it is present at birth and it goes a biphasic uh, development or biphasic growth the first three years and again at a maximum activity or maximum growth by 12 years of age and by 18 to 20 years it reaches adult size and comes below the level of nose. Right? That is in a tubular fashion it grows. The natural ostium uh, opens into the ethmoid infundibulum. There is also another thing that is the accessory ostium. There is one accessory ostium which is present in around 16 percentage of cases. This percentage is important. Accessory ostium is present in 16 percentage. So where this accessory ostium comes? This accessory ostium is coming always posterior to the natural ostium. If the uh, natural ostium is here, then this, uh, if this is the natural ostium, and the accessory ostium will be posterior to that. Okay, this will be the accessory ostium. Actually, here comes a, a frontalella. There is an anterior frontalella which I will deal along with the ethmoid bone. Anterior frontalella and the posterior frontalella. And actually, this uh, posterior or the accessory ostium comes along with the posterior frontalella. And that is more posterior and it is present in around. 16 percentage of patients. Okay, and what is the clinical significance of this? If there is an accessory ostium, then if the secretions after going through a stellate pattern, it is coming out through the natural ostium and if an accessory ostium is present, there is high tendency that this will circulate from the natural ostium to the accessory ostium. And through the accessory ostium, it will again come back into the maxillary sinus. Got it? If there is an accessory ostium, the secretions coming out of the natural ostium will circulate posteriorly towards the accessory ostium and it will re-enter into the maxillary sinus through the accessory ostium. So the secretions will recirculate, recirculate, and there is chance of stagnation. So what will happen? it will contribute to the um, development of a sinusitis. Okay, there is deranged mucociliary pattern and there is chance of stagnation leading to sinusitis. So what you have to do? During surgery, if you are finding out an accessory ostium, then make this accessory as well as this natural ostium into a single ostium. Okay, combine these two. Never leave this accessory ostium alone. If there is an accessory ostium, it should be combined with a natural ostium. If you are doing a diagnostic nasal endoscopy and you are seeing an ostium in a vertical uh, orientation, that is always the accessory ostium. And it, because in majority of cases or in most of the cases, the natural ostium will not be seen by a diagnostic nasal endoscopy.
So that is the importance of accessory ostium. Okay. And while doing an endoscopy sinus surgery, how will you locate the maxillary sinus ostium? You have to do a middle mantle androstomy, isn't it? So to do, do a middle mantle androstomy, you have to first you have to locate the maxillary sinus ostium. And otherwise, what will happen? There is chance of injury to the orbit. That is the most common complication if you are not correctly locating the maxillary sinus ostium. So how will you locate it? During an endoscopy sinus surgery, I will say the most uh, easiest part of uh, endoscopy sinus surgery is a middle mantle androstomy. That is opening the or widening the natural ostium of the maxillary sinus. And how will you uh, do that? Um, I am not, not going to the in-depth endoscopy sinus surgery. I am just concentrating on the maxillary sinus ostium. So here comes our uncinate process. Uncinate process is closing. From the picture it is very evident that uncinate uh, process is acting as a door preventing the entry into the maxillary sinus. So first thing you have to reset the uncinate process. It is called uncinectomy or infundibulotomy. Isn't it? It is called infundibulotomy. Infund Infundibulotomy. Isn't it? Like we are tracheostem. Otomy. We are opening the ethmoid infundibulum. We are opening the ethmoid infundibulum. By cutting the uncinate roses. So, you remove the uncinate roses. Easy, isn't it? Remove the uncinate roses. You will reach the maxillary sinus ostium. Widen it. But it is not that much easy as I said. If you can't uh, locate that, you remove the uncinate process, still you cannot locate that. What may be the possibility? One thing, this mucosa may be edematous. Okay, this mucosa may be edematous. Or you have not removed the postro inferior part of the uncinate process. There are remnants of the uh, uncinate process. Mostly in the postero inferior part, this part. So you also remove that. Then with your cell seeker, look. Okay. And also while palpating through the cell seeker, it is better to go or follow the bony inferior turbinate rather than going posteriorly. Okay. So with your cell seeker, you introduce it. You palpate the bony uh, inferior turbinate, go, 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 uh, anteriorly and posteriorly, then you will reach here. Otherwise, what will happen? If you are introducing like this, you will go and injure the lamina or you will penetrate the orbit. So, one thing is um, complete removal of the unstained process. Look for any uh, edematous mucosa or any remnant of the unsinate process, especially in the postero inferior part. Then follow the bony inferior turbinate and reach the natural ostium. And one another thing you can do is, if you uh, poke on the or give pressure on the frontenella, the bubble will appear through the natural ostium. It's very simple to understand. If you press on this, you press on this part, bubble will come out. So that in that way also you can identify. You remove the uncinate process. You will try to uh, palpate uh, through the bony inferior turbinate. You can't uh, reach the, you uh, gave pressure over the frontal lane. No bubbles coming. You are in a confusion. Then what can you do? In the frontal sinus uh, class, I told that there is a frontal refination method. Like that, you here also you can do, you can enter the maxillary sinus. How? You can go through a canine fossa puncture. Okay, canine fossa puncture. What is this canine fossa? Oh, that I forgot. Where will you look for the um, max, uh, maxillary sinus tenderness? That is in the canine fossa. That is in the anterior wall where the bone is thinnest. Canine fossa. Where it comes? Actually, this canine fossa comes here. Almost this part comes to canine fossa. That is, it has passes through two 
horizontal lines and two vertical lines. Canyon fossa is an area between two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. The upper uh, horizontal line passing through the infraorbital foramen or the infraorbital ring and the lower one passing through the upper alveolar margin. Upper alveolar margin. Okay, infraorbital uh, foramen margin and the upper horizontal line passing through the infraorbital foramen and the lower horizontal line passing through the upper alveolar margin and the medial vertical one passing through the canine ridge here comes your canine teeth and then goes the canine ridge okay canine ridge and the lateral vertical line passing through first molar okay first molar right so that is the canine fossa so by two uh, horizontal lines and two vertical lines. The superior horizontal line passing through the infraorbital foramen and the inferior horizontal line passing through upper alveolar margin. And the medial vertical line passing through the canine ridge and the lateral vertical line passing through first molar teeth. So in between comes the canine fossa. And that is exactly over the canine fossa you are looking for the uh, maxillary sinus tenderness and also exactly over that area you puncture to reach into the uh, maxillary sinus. The anterior uh, maxillotomy is also done in this area for cadwell like operation and identify the canine fossa and uh, you puncture with the trocar and introduce the endoscope through the canine fossa into the maxillary sinus. Keep it there and through the nose you introduce your cell seeker or uh, um, angled black sleeve and elevate the uh, mucosa. If you can see the uh, bulging mucosa through the endoscope then you can uh, very confidently puncture that site and enter into the maxillary sinus. Okay. So these are the method by through which you can enter into uh, identify the natural ostium and can open a uh, middle mate land ostium. Okay. And one common difficulty you encounter during uh, your middle medial androstomy is that or uh, identification of maxillary sinus is that this can be your uh, maxillary sinus mucosa this red color and while uh, trying to enter it using a spoon or with your instrument there is a chance that you accidentally elevate the mucosa along with that. Okay. Especially the uh, mucosa on the medial wall and also the roof of orbit. So what will happen? This mucosa will get elevated from there and it will retract like this. So what you see through this as an opening is an area between the bone and this retracted mucosa. Got it? You accidentally retracted or elevate the mucosa with your instrument. And what you are seeing is bone with the elevated mucosa. But your sinus is still inside with the inside the intact mucosa. So what can you do? It is very difficult situation. However hard you try to um, catch hold of this. Through this you won't uh, get it or you won't be able to catch hold of that and this will again retract the mucosa uh, more laterally. So the ideal instrument you can use is a bent black sleeve with a suction. Okay, bent black sleeve also with suction. So if you catch hold of that with the suction you can um, hold the mucosa along with that with the uh, forceps you catch hold of that okay and if you have no bent black sleeve with suction then what will you do you keep the uh, endoscope there and with the tip of the endoscope you just close the nostril and ask the patient to inhale and while you are inhaling this mucosa will bulge 
it will go towards the natural ostium and then at that point you can catch hold of that and make an incision here. So you can make an incision here and you can enter into the maxillary sinus. Okay. So along with the maxillary sinus in this class, I told you about the osteology, the relations of the maxilla, then the importance on the uh, roof of the intraorbital nerve and on the floor, the relation with the dangers and chance of formation of an oroander fistula and on the medial wall there comes the natural osteum, its relations, its opening into the ethmoid infundibular and also the method to identify the natural osteum during an endoscopic sinus surgery. Right? If you have any doubt, just ask in the comment box. Thank you.